So thank you for having me today. And um, thanks everybody for being here, even though I can't see the lot of people having pizza there. <clears throat> Um, so today I'm I'm going to talk about um something I'm really keen about, which is really looking at AI within that from perspective. And as introduced, I'm part of Imagination Lancaster, which is um kind of design and architecture led, led lab with the Lancaster University, and I'm part of this special interest group called Design for Digital Good. And what we tend to do in imagination is uh, we're a collection of researchers, designers, or practitioners, and educators, and we're trying to kind of use design as a sort of instrument to bring about social change. So a lot of people doing a lot of things around healthcare, world building, making spaces, sustainability, is a policy and governance. So for me, I'm part of the Design for Digital Good network, and particularly the Design for Digital Good is a kind of um research that came out of this um, ESRC Digital Good Network, whereby researchers are kind of really interested in trying to, you know, how can we design technologies to ensure that they are good for society in general? How can we go about designing good AI systems that are going to bring about equity, diversity, but also inclusivity in our societies? So this was like a kind of a larger project that has been done across different universities in the UK, and within the Lancaster group, we're really kind of very keen on how can we use design to bring about this idea of social good. And for me, being basically most of my research is around HCI and particularly African HCI, I was really keen about, you know, when we talk about this idea of vision of a good AI society, what does it look like from an African perspective? But also when we're thinking about AI for good, what do we really mean by that? Because a lot of narrative within HCI, but also across the AI, AI landscape is around using AI towards one of the sustainable development goals, which in essence is more of kind of trying to kind of reinvent the world around post colonial computing, but also HCI 4D. So for me, <clears throat> what I was really keen on is kind of thinking about what sort of ideas or what sort of discussions can I look into to advance the sort of idea of a vision of a very good, of a good AI society within the African context. So this kind of brings me to the focus of this talk, which is around the sort of question that I've been thinking around is the African a standard reserve within global AI landscape or AI pipeline. <clears throat> so this is going to be like a, the sort of the background of the talk. So first I'll try to talk about the kind of the nuances around artificial intelligence and basically focusing on this sort of idea of Heideggerian AI, where uh, Martin Heidegger in his work, The Question Concerning Technology, looks at this sort of idea of what is the essence of technology. So this was something that Heidegger did um, after the Second World War, and he was quite really interested in trying to dig much into the sort of the philosophy of AI, uh, sorry, philosophy of technology, but also thinking about how those sort of ideas have informed some of the earlier um, conceptions and misconceptions around AI. And this led sort of this sort of idea of the Heideggerian AI. And in that, I wanted to kind of kind of bring into attention this sort of ideas that Heidegger was, was talking about in the 1970s around the essence of technology and how technology presents itself at this sort of means and ends towards um, achieving human subjectivity, but also human prosperity. And at the end of the talk, I'll try to kind of link it up with some sort of few case studies around this sort of idea of pipeline, how this sort of concept of pipeline has been viewed across different dimensions of Africa, but also when we think about the global AI landscape, what sort of roles or what sort of dimensions does Africa or Africa as a whole take in, in those spaces? Of course, I know that that's like a very broad sort of questioning, but I'm just going to share some of the initial ideas that I had um, around that space. So first, you know, when we're thinking about AI, <clears throat> you know, we talk about a lot of things. I'm not an AI researcher. I don't really see myself to be a HCI researcher. I'm just working within that space. But basically, my, my, my PhD was in computer science, but also now I'm in a design lab. So for me, that was a sort of kind of confusion around when people are talking about AI, what are they really meaning? Are they talking about, you know, this idea of super intelligence or using different techniques of machine learning to explore different dimensions of something that looks like human intelligence, 
or why is it that all this thing is all about? So a lot of researchers across different disciplines have looked into AI as a sort of an intellectual project that has been taken up by big um, multinational corporations. It is a science of trying to understand the mind, but also the brain and human conception of things. Is it like an industrial art? Is it a tool? Is it a promise? So there's, there's a lot of kind of misconception, but also a lot of debate around what AI is. It's not just about, you know, <clears throat> chat GPT and the sort of um, LLMs that we're seeing nowadays. Is it, a lot of people have put like so much fundamental questions around what do we mean? What, what do we actually trying to explore by this idea of artificial intelligence? Is it more of a mimicry of human intelligence or is it something that is social or is it cultural? Why exactly it is? So that's like a very, kind of there's a complex sort of dynamic within the AI, AI literature, but also across other disciplines whereby we've been con continuously told, you know, that sort of, you know, this sort of AI systems are supposed to build something or like sort of common sense, build on the common sense knowledge that we have. And we've been told that, you know, AI is a sort of idea that it's a sort of inspiration that we needed to explore. We need to fight, fight about it. Like when we look at, when we think about China, or also in the US, the sort of AI war that is going on, but also between Microsoft and Google. But also we had this sort of ideas that, well, AI is something that we should aspire for. You know, we, we want to live in a workless society whereby we just spend our time trying to explore measurable activities. We don't want to engage in things that are making life more stressful for us. So there's a whole range of arguments around there. But when you look at the literature or like the history of AI, a lot of researchers are claiming that, and with a lot of evidence that AI doesn't have any moral intelligence, you know, and AI is just some sort of um, <clears throat> sort of confusion or is some sort of, um, you know, a lot of hype that has been happening that this sort of idea of super intelligence is something that you know, we might not really attain it in the next 10, 15 years, but we don't know. So for me, I think you kind of thinking about this whole idea of AI, which is something very abstract to me, is kind of reading Kate Crawford, a book around Atlas of AI. And she, she made this sort of strong point that AI is not, it's neither artificial and it's not intelligent. It's a sort of mutation of human, of, of human values in different ways. And a lot of researchers have been saying that, well, all this sort of idea of intelligence, we have limited understanding of it. A lot of researchers have spent the last 200, 300 years trying to understand this sort of idea of how does the human brain or human mind works. But then researchers come in like 50 or more years thinking, oh, we are going to solve this idea of intelligence. So there was a, there's a lot of sort of criticism back and forth across different disciplines as to what this whole idea of artificial intelligence is. So for me, I, kind of reading through the literature and trying to understand what, what, you know, what are we talking about? What's this whole thing about artificial intelligence? A lot of, you know, government, but also industries are putting so much money and resources and capital into it. Is this sort of thinking that we are, as we are now, within the sort of hype whereby a lot of industries have, have developed there's a lot of capabilities that have been developed around using artificial intelligence in trying to bring about improvement in healthcare, in education, in our energy usage. But also there's a sort of a lot of backlog issues around, well, we don't know what this machine is going to do. You know, we, we might want it to do specific things to advance our own cause. The humans are then the drivers of AI. But then there's a sort of issues around we need to regulate AI and we need to control it. And this is where the AI alignment, but also the air control literature came by. And this sort of common problem about uh, the shutdown problem, like how can we design AI system in such a way that we have the control, that we decide on when it does something or when it doesn't. But then there's a sort of question around who defines we? Are we talking about people that have power, that have resources, or are we talking about the, the common public? So, <clears throat> That's why I said, you know, there's a lot of narrative that's been happening within sort of the AI initial cycle I, I would have seen from the 1940s to date. And what, what it appears to me within the sort of space, because I'm coming into it like two years, two years ago, is 
when we're trying to think about the African, we know that during the Industrial Revolution, the sort of role that Africa and Africans have, have played. And we know recently, or the sort of idea of the energy crisis that we're seeing in Europe, the role that Africa and Africans are playing within that sort of space. So it gets me to think about this sort of question around is the African a standard reserve? And this is this sort of whole idea about standard reserve is something that Heidegger has talked about. And now I'm going to talk about a bit about what the Heideggerian AI is all about and Heidegger's idea towards the question concerning technology. So of course, um, first when we're thinking about Heidegger, so Heidegger is a German philosopher of technology. Um, he did a lot of work, most of his work centers around this sort of philosophy as a whole. But he's also looking at this sort of philosophy of being. What does it actually mean to be or to become to be a human being? But also Heidegger kind of studies this sort of idea of the sort of the phenomena that we use to experience the world, but also the sort of phenomena that we use to, to explore the world. And this is what's been called phenomenology. And in, in that sort of space, after the Second World War, Heidegger kind of pushes attention towards what is the role that technology is playing in, in the modern life. And this is um, after the Second World War, there's a sort of destruction around the world and people were kind of into contemplation and reflection around, you know, how can we, we need to have a rethink about the essence of modern technology, whereby what it means to be a human being, but also this whole essence of being has been reduced to something that is more like an object or like a stuff that can be dominated by manipulated by other human beings. So there was a sort of power dynamic that's happening within those space. And Heidegger was kind of very keen to kind of look at, you know, how can philosophy help us in trying to address the sort of problems in society? So within the sort of the Heideggerian <clears throat> um, philosophical tradition, is this sort of idea of how does being as a sort of concept, how does it manifest itself in the age of technology? And Heidegger was making this sort of ontological claim that technology as it is, create this sort of destructive relationship between human beings and the object that they create for themselves or the objects across the, um, across the social world. And uh, the essence of technology can only be understood by the sort of everyday relationships and interactions we have with it nature, but also with the technology that we put for ourselves. And how in turn technology changes the kind of the idea of who we are or what we can do or what we are capable of or not. So in, in this kind of philosophical tradition of Heidegger, Heidegger was saying, was kind of making a point that man in its nature has been present themselves, or man presents itself as a sort of the center of being. You know, how human beings from our nature, we create tools and techniques so that we can satisfy our <clears throat> basic needs, but also how technology, the sort of tools and technologies that we create, how they have some sort of effect or have some sort of control as to how we understood ourselves, but also how we understood our relationship with things around us. So in essence, Heidegger was making this sort of case that the essence of technology is not really technological, but more so about ontology. That technology can be can be seen as a sort of instrument to guide us to think about our essence, our being. And when we think about technology not as something that is technological, but something that is ontological, we come to the realization that technology, from its essence, is meant to foreclose, is meant to stack, is meant to inframe other possibilities. And this is, I think, something that has been <clears throat> quite of relevance to a lot of researchers in design, but also in HCI around this sort of idea of how we can use design to create new futures. And this sort of idea of Tony Freire around defuturing, how by the invention of technologies that we create, we are forcluding other futures. So that's this sort of idea of defuturing. And, and Heidegger was kind of making this sort of ontological claim, as I mentioned earlier, that technology is not just a means towards revealing or exploring our subjectivities as human beings, but technology is a way of revealing, is a sort of way of revealing truth about ourselves and our nature, but also about the sort of things that happen in our societies. So Heidegger wasn't really just looking at technology as some sort of table or a chair or an aeroplane as an object that can be, that has some sort of instrumentality. But Heidegger was looking at technology as more of 
as a sort of way of being, as a sort of way of exploring our being as human beings, but also our relationship with the sort of the, the society or the social world that we live in. So within the sort of within the his book, the essence of technology, uh, Heidegger showed that you know, the promise that we see within the industrial revolution is that technology kind of is a sort of an instrument that allow us to free to have some sort of more freedom. You know, we have cars, we don't have to walk, we have airplanes, we don't have to travel multiple of months to each other part of the planet. The technology has a sort of promise that it keeps promising to ourselves that it's going to create some sort of freedom in our society. But then Heidegger was saying that the danger is not that technology is going to destroy culture and aesthetics, just has been seen during the Second World War, but that technology it creates a sort of a way of being, a way of engaging with ourselves, a way of engaging with reality and nature that is technological in a sense. So technology presents itself as a sort of the only means, but also the only end towards exploring the truth. So most of Heidegger's ideas are kind of philosophical in nature. I think for me, what really um, stand out was how Heidegger's ideas are on being have been taken by AI researchers. So for example, Herbert in his book, What Computers Still Can't Do, was kind of critiquing this sort of idea of intelligence as a, as a, as a, as a sort of concept. And he was, he built his argument around Heidegger's idea of being, uh, sorry, destiny, this sort of idea of being in there, being there, that for, for, you, for one to understand what, the, what it means to be a human being, one needs to look at how human beings and other organisms, how they engage in the world as it is. It's not just something that is preconceived, it's something that one understood or one explores as it happens <clears throat> in the world. So that kind of provides the sort of basis around the sort of idea of Heideggerian AI, which is, you know, in the earlier conception of AI, <clears throat> a lot of researchers have been thinking about well, when we're talking about intelligence or what it means to be a human being in the age of technology, you know, what about agency? What about subjectivity? What about human rights? What about expertise, judgment, emotions, common sense, love and fear? What about all those sort of things? How, how are we supposed to make sense of this abstract idea of artificial intelligence in relation to all this sort of complex dimension of what it means to be a human being? And when we're thinking about, you know, AI, What's, what, what kind of being or what kind of perception or love or expertise or right it's AI simulating and it's trying to represent. So, so the Heideggerian AI narrative was more of like kind of bringing into AI narrative sort of fundamental questions that have been put forward by philosophers across Europe for more than 300 years ago. So I know that um, a lot of people will be questioning, well, that's a bit too philosophical. There's no kind of practical dimensions to it. And I think in, in, in the next part of the conversation, what I'll try to do is kind of trying to show how the sort of, those sort of abstract ideas that Heidegger has, for example, the standard reserve, how we can use those sort of concept in trying to understand the dynamic of what's happening currently around AI and specifically looking at African context. So Heidegger was kind of thinking about this sort of idea of enframing. And as I mentioned earlier, Heidegger was saying that what well, the essence of technology is not technological, but it's ontological. And that technology by its nature presents, na presents nature, but also the earth and humans as standard reserve. The technology from its essence, it tends to objectify whatever comes across its way. So Heidegger was making this sort of claim that the sort of distinction that we try to make between subject and object is all part of this sort of um, technological thinking, whereby humans are always thinking in relation to technology, but technology being the sort of the determining factor in that sort of relationship. So the human is not really um, the essence or there's a kind of the center of the world. The technology is the one that is defining how people relate to themselves and, and others. So within that space also, um, Heidegger was, was kind of directing our attention that technology is not just good for something. And what he was trying to do here is kind of 
direct our attention towards how this how technology in its essence how it tries to inframe but also present nature as standard result and Heidegger uses this sort of idea of the the Rhine Dam in Germany and he was saying because of the technological age the dam is not just a dam but it's been because of the technological thinking um, within those space the dam has been perceived and has been conceived in society as a sort of source of energy. So the dam has been transformed in a way into an instrument that can be used to generate energy. So the dam doesn't stand on its own as a sort of <clears throat> as a sort of natural um, entity. It's more of an, an instrument that is been, well, it's more like an instrument that doesn't stand on its own, but is an instrument that has been transformed but also reform by the by the by by the defining nature of technology. So, looking at that sort of example, Heidegger was kind of trying to show kind of very basic sort of examples with the chair or with the table in the office that man by nature is not transformed into a standard reserve, but man on his own ascribe and present himself to others as a standard reserve. And this is kind of the key point for me. The man is not by nature transformed into a standard reserve, but man on his own, for his own sake, ascribe or present himself to others as standard reserve. And this kind of links back to the sort of whole idea of the role that the African is going to play or the role that African has played during the Industrial Revolution and, and the sort of the possibility of that sort of the, the limitation of those sort of possibilities when we're talking about AI. <clears throat> so for example, um, kind of building on the sort of idea of Heidegger, of how technology as an instrument that has been developed by man towards man's um, ends. So when we think about Alexa as it is now, everybody might think, well, it's just like um, an AI system that I can talk to, it could tell me about the weather, it could you know, put the lights on. But when you think in depth into it, and I think this is what Crawford does in the Atlas of AI, she tries to kind of take very basic um, technologies that we have in our in, in, in our homes and in our society and tries to look into what are the essence of those technologies. So when you think about Alexa, <clears throat> you might be thinking that, oh, this is just a smart machine. But in essence, there's a whole network of systems embedded in it. Your interaction with the machine, it's been defined not by yourself, but by the machine, by the architecture of the system. So for example, whenever one has a relationship with Alexa, First, you might be a consumer because you're using the you're using Alexa to generate information or to ascribe it to do specific tasks. But in that sort of space, you're also working as a as a as a laborer because you are creating um, the voice prompt and the feedback so that the system tries to make itself better. But also at that sort of point, one becomes a product that be sold that could be sold to other. Um, other people, other industries. So when you look at that sort of very basic example, you could see how building on Heidegger's idea, how Alexa is not just a tool as it is. It's not just a tool that we could just see as a, as a sort of machine, but there is a sort of so much embedded dynamic behind it. Another example is this sort of idea of Microsoft T.AI. So is this sort of chatbot that was created by Microsoft. And at some point it was, I think it was put on Twitter and then it was been racist, you know, saying all sorts of silly stuff. And a lot of researchers were saying, well, what that shows to us is that <clears throat> say that AI is not just a machine that is abstract, but it's a sort of mutation of human values, like everyday human values. We fit into this machine and then it feedbacks as the same sort of narrative that we're fitting into it. And this kind of leads me to the sort of the whole points about this sort of conversation that we're having is this idea of the AI pipeline. So I came across this sort of this paper by some colleagues that looked at how computer vision research has powered the sort of ex expansion of surveillance and surveillance capitalism. And in, in this paper, what these researchers were trying to show is how in computer vision research, how human beings, or human parts are being considered as object or region of interest. And it, this gets me to think about, well, if you're thinking about 
the global surveillance AI pipeline within this, within this sort of the within the sort of landscape of computer vision research and how human beings or human body parts are being considered as object or region of interest. What about the, the African or what about Africa? We know that Africa <clears throat> has been and it, it will continuously be sort of a, a region of interest to fuel the Western Revol EV revolution. We know that a lot of the minerals um, that are needed at the beginning of the EV revolution um, came from African communities. We know that the Trans-Saharan gas pipeline, which is going to supply some of the energy that is needed in Europe because of the war in Ukraine, we know about that. And this kind of shows the sort of, the sort of dependencies or how the African as a whole, Africa as a, as a sort of entity, but also Africans, how they've been co-opted as a sort of standard reserves or a region of interest to foil um, specific um, issues that are happening across the globe. But also we've seen how Africans um, via the open AI um, through the, a company in Kenya, how um, specific Africans are being used as laborers to scrap the internet and try and get rid of all the sort of toxic um, information so that um, a lot of users in the West could have this sort of clear cut um, narrative or answers whenever we, we try to use um, AI systems. So when we're thinking about AI pipeline, I think there's a need for us to kind of go back a bit um, in history and try to think about this whole idea of pipelines, you know, thinking about the sort of the, <clears throat> the gas pipelines that I just talked about, but also thinking about how African resources are just been considered as kind of standard reserves to, to, to be used or to be instrumented across Europe. And we could see that with the gas pipeline that happened you know, across Chad and Cameroon, but also the gas pipeline, um, sorry, the, the, the oil pipeline that happened that, 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 that happened across Chad and Cameroon, but also the gas pipeline that has been, that, that, that is supposed to run from Nigeria um, through Algeria and Tunisia to Europe. And we could see the sort of narrative that, is, that has been presented, but also the reality that African resources and African manpower and expertise is being co-opted as standard reserves to fuel the sort of the energy crisis that is happening in Europe. Another dimension of this sort of um, standard reserve or exploitative dimension is the, 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 the example that I gave um, about communities in Kenya or how Africans in Kenya, how they, they, they have been used as laborers to kind of push for this um, idea of super intelligence through Ch chat GPT and all, all sort of um, chatbots. And what really stands out here is the, the sort of the whole dynamic of the Afri of Africa as a community, but also Africans as human entities, how they've been co-opted as standard reserve for to be instrumented by some abstract um, entities. That, that might be a corporation, that might be an institution somewhere else. When you look at the whole pipeline dimensions of it, um, from the sort of resources that are needed to power um, the data centers, from the sort of the data that is, good, that is needed to ensure that um, the models have something to train on, but also um, the sort of narrative that is needed to, to show that these technologies have some sort of capabilities, the African has always been put at the, for, at, at, at the fringes of this sort of narrative. It's always around African resources, but also African people standing by as sort of um sort of options that can be instrumented for for these of others. So this kind of brings this to, to the end of my 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 presentation. This sort of idea of the, the kind of the coming back of neo feudalism. We know that during the feudal system, there's a kind of a, a four tier system whereby um, small amount of people control <clears throat> the land, but also control 
the economy. And then a lot of people, like a lot of small number of working class, and then a whole range of people that are laboring. And in his book, The Coming of New Federalism, um, Kotkin talks about there are people who prayed, there are people who fought, and there are people who labored. And when we think about um, this sort of reemergence of the feudal society, as we've seen in Europe um, over some hundred of years, is that the Africans are always being considered as the, at, at the bottom of the, the entire landscape or also the, the pipeline, you know, in terms of Africa being a space whereby all the minerals that have been needed to forward the evil revolution could be extracted with little or no responsibility. Africans can be used as um, Africans can be used as um, imaginaries to to amplify existing narrative around white imaginaries, things around stereotyping or creating specific dynamic as to well AI as we see as as we know it or technological innovation is something that belongs to the West um, and more of that. So this kind of short conversation kind of leads me back to this sort of this sort of question around is the African standard reserve in the global AI landscape? And my argument is yes. I don't know if others agree or not, but I'm trying to I'll open up the, the, the floor for more conversation because I wanted it to be a more of like a present a whole range of ideas, don't talk too much into them, and then allow for like a more open conversation with people with that have joined us online but also in person. Thank you.